I think it will make a really big difference for a team such as Nepal. Like for instance, a sports scientist could identify where the best location for you is to play, to make it more difficult for opponents coming from overseas. So I was just saying to you before, I would play at the highest level possible, you know, way, way at high altitude. I'd play in hot temperatures because then your players can adapt to it and it's going to make it more difficult for players coming from overseas, such as Australia or in other countries. The VAR Show. The one place for your weekly football update. So hello, a very warm welcome to the VR show, the show which talks about all the base major football leagues in detail. Today we are going to conduct a few interviews and we have one of Australia's leading sports scientists, Dr. Craig Duncan with us. So without wasting much time, I would like to first thank Dr. Craig for coming on the show. Thank you and welcome to the show. And I would like to begin by asking you, how are you and what are you doing these days? Ah, I'm very, very well. And thank you. It's, it's very nice to be on the show with you. And uh, so thank you and, and hello to everyone uh, that's listening. Um, you know, at the moment, because of the, the pandemic, it's a, little bit, uh, it's a little bit different for me because normally I travel a lot around the world um, because I consult to a lot of teams uh, in Australia, in Asia, Europe, South America. So normally I, I travel quite extensively, but now at the moment I'm based in Sydney and just monitoring data and uh, working with coaches from, you know, from a distance. Of course, I knew like you are very much into sports science. At least that was what I could uh, infer from whatever I read about you online. And many of our listeners do not know what sports science is, you know, like that's a basic tool. So you, can you please explain a little bit what it is? Well, really sports science is, the, the way I see it, it's, it, it, it's quite a large area, but it's very much about everything that's sort of the off field, the fitness for the players, the, it incorporates nutrition, the psychology, um, you know, injury prevention, uh, strength, speed, power, all these sort of things that go and help uh, the footballer to be better. But also it incorporates analysis as well. So, you know, analyzing games, sports scientists would do that. I, I actually really probably call myself more a, a human performance sort of uh, scientist. So, you know, all, everything that um, is involved in football, uh, in respect to getting the players ready so the coach can coach them, um, really increasing their fitness, increasing their ability on the field. Of course, like you said, like you uh, 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 consider yourself more like a human coach, performance coach. So what is the difference between a, a, a maybe a sports scientist and what you said? Uh, look, I don't think it's, it's too much different, except I take a very holistic perspective to, to what I do. Um, I look at the player from many different different uh, uh, angles to make sure that they're they're ready physically and psychologically to do what the coach requires them to do tactically. Of course, I know. Like uh, you, you, of course, for me personally, I know I've been exposed to sports science because of my friends who have done similar stuff. But like, how important is sports science according to you? I think it's very, <laughs> look, it's very important. Um, look, football is a, is a game that you need to be physically very good at the highest level. You, you must be physically very good, psychologically good. We must be able to analyze the games uh, appropriately. We need to be able to manage players so when they play, they're physically right to play and ready to play. What they eat, what they drink, um, how much uh, effort that they do in training, the management of training loads. It's very important if we want to maximize the potential of the players that we work with. In actual fact, I think sports science would be very positive for teams such as Nepal. And, and I work with uh, other teams, you know, that need, uh, that could really benefit from this area that mightn't be as good technically or have the, the best players. Okay. But if you're very fit and very healthy, then it's going to work very well for you. Of course, I knew, like I wanted to ask you, like you said, like it's good. It will be beneficial for a team like Nepal, and 
like how much of a difference does having a like implementing a good sports science base in your team and without implementing how much of a difference does it make for a team i think it will make a really big difference for a team such as nepal like for instance a sports scientist could identify where the best location for you is to play to make it more difficult for opponents coming from overseas so i was just saying to you before i would play at the highest level possible you know way way at high altitude i'd play in hot temperatures because then your players can adapt to it and it's going to make it more difficult for players coming from overseas such as australia or in other countries of course anyway like i'll go a bit personal and when did you decide to get associated with sports science look i was a football player um and then i did my undergraduate degree in sports science and then my postgraduate and obviously uh then my doctorate um in the sports science field so when i thought that i'm not going to be good enough to be a player i thought well the next best thing is to be involved in the sport by um you know being in in this side of the game of course you like uh sports science of late at least it has come into the mainstream market especially with you know like the household names like maybe united liverpool or the premier league teams you know like showcasing that okay we have a department with this so is it something that is recently uh, a recent thing that has come up or is it something that has been for a long while but neglected i think that it's been there for a long while and it's been neglected um and then the other thing is maybe sports science wasn't specific enough to football so we have to look at football uh specifically and and see how sports science can benefit the football coach you know really my job is making the coach's job easier by giving him the information he needs um on his players so he knows that they can perform to what he needs them to do so you know like uh, you earlier you said that you have been traveling you travel all, all around the globe you know like providing consultancy look and so how much do you have to adapt you know like to the situation where you are working at the moment do you have to change how you work yeah look at the moment you know very much a lot of it's online but i'm sort of used to doing that you know from a virtual perspective so one of my teams that i work with is in the j league so you know in the japanese league uh, they're there so i will speak to the coach uh, i will get the data through whatsapp or email or whatever and then i can look at that data and then speak to the coach and identify you know what players are in in good shape ready to play um is the team you know performing physically the way it should so you know i i'm quite used to doing that so it just means that i can't be there face to face of course and you spoke about another important you took out, you used the word data and that's again another new thing that's being thrown around because of the maybe like how uh, the top teams have used does has technology evolved with sports science and the, has it been uh, how did you have to adapt to it because you have been in the game for quite a while now and maybe it was not the earlier yeah very much but uh, look australia i'm very fortunate that australia is one of the leaders in in the world in sports science so for instance gps you might have seen players using gps to see how many meters they do at the game and different speeds and that look I, i've been using gps since 2002 when it first came out so many many years ago so i was able to adapt and then see the evolution of that so there's a lot of the technology that is out now that i've been involved with from the start um and you know helped uh the Uh, companies develop that technology yeah and you know like staying with gps you know i have seen a, a lot of them use it and i have been spoken to one owner of the company what what is the use of a gps what do you do with it well, well basically the gps tells you exactly what the player has done in training and in a game situation so what we know is or, or what we do how we use gps is in respect to training we identify exactly how many kilometers should be should be run at what speeds etc so we predict the outcome of the training session based on what the coach wants to achieve the players wear the gps and we can see is if what they do matches what we predicted they should do so ultimately they're ready to perform when they have to perform we use it in game situations to 
identify exactly what each individual player has done physically in that game. Because we've been doing this for so long, we know what the world, world's best players do in every, uh, every position, in pretty, pretty much every tactical formation. So we know what the, the gold standard is for a player, and then we try and match that. So we try and build that and identify where players are at in respect to this performance um, criteria. Of course, and you're like, uh, on a personal level, are you only, do you only work with football teams and players or do you work with other sports also? Yeah, look, football is my, the, the sport I primarily work with. But I, yes, I do. Because of my success in football, I do work in other sports as well. So I have a company um, called Performance Intelligence Agency. And so we work across sports. So some Australian sports that you might know, like such as rugby league, but we've also worked in basketball, Olympic type sports as well. So any sport, we can really adapt our, our processes um, to, to work with the, the clients. So uh, across the, you know, across the uh, genre of sports, does your work kind of remain the same, like what you do? Yeah, look, there are some sports such as like cycling, where sports science is very, very big. Um, and it's very well accepted. Some of the Olympic sports as well. Um, it differs somewhat uh, among the team sports, but you know, it's very powerful with international teams. Like for example, I did the last World Cup with the Australian national team. But for those four years, there's extensive travel around the world that players need to do. So a sports scientist can manage when the players sleep, monitor how they sleep, um, maximizing their potential to perform when they have to perform. Like there's things that we can do to help these situations. You know, if they have to perform in the heat, how can we get them ready to perform in the heat if they're playing in countries that are in the winter, but then they have to come to UAE or somewhere and play in 38 degrees, even though they're living in England at the same time and it's only 15 degrees. We need to prepare them for that, and that's what sports science can also do. Of course, and you like you you spoke about how you worked with the Australian national team, and it's like I wanted to ask you like you said like you have to keep on monitoring all throughout the maybe uh, time tenure that you are working with them and the different pitches or the temperatures or the climates you are going to play at. So, do the club side let you work with them? Yeah, look, I, you know what I do. Um, is, is when I'm working with a national team, I develop very good relationships with the clubs that the players are playing at. Because it's in the club's best interests that they, they work with me. So after the FIFA window, after they've played for the national team, that they return to their club in the best possible uh, physical condition. And you have also worked with the club side with Sydney FC, I think in Western Sydney Wanderers. How different is it like working with a club and national side? Look, a, a club side is, is quite different. In, in a lot of ways, it's easier because you've got the players every day um, and you get to see them every day. So you can manage them. You have much more control. So yes, I've worked with multiple clubs in Australia and throughout the world. Um, and even though it's hard work day in, day out, with uh, international teams, you don't have as much control. It's just different. I enjoy both. Um, I've been fortunate to work with a number of international teams and uh, I enjoy that very much. For instance, um, you know, with Australia, we won the Asian Cup 215. I was working with them. Uh, Iran, I worked with the Iran national team, very good team. Um, and we lost in the semi-final of the Asian Cup 219. Um, yeah, but I also am very interested in working with countries like Nepal, Bangladesh, uh, Vietnam, even you know, these um, smaller countries that might know sports science and developing sports science in that, those countries. So I would like to see that um, and to enhance the education of people that might be interested in being a sports scientist in Nepal. That's a great interest for me, um, you know, in the future. Of course, I like uh, personally, I would love to be a sports scientist going forward, but I don't know whether that's possible or not. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, like, suppose if a young guy or a girl wanted to be pursue a 
career in sports science what uh, what should he or she do to you know like pursue a career well i'm not sure of the education process in nepal um but if there is a anything to do with fitness in nepal physical education or anything like that that is very good to study um however your background computer engineering is also quite interesting because you would have a very good understanding of data um i could work with you um to develop a uh, different software that could be very uh positive in respect to sort science and how we analyze data because you know data that is not analyzed well is no no good what we want to do with that data is to create uh insight or information for the coaches so yeah um i think if people are interested in this field they might start off studying fitness um physical education um but then you know you could come to australia and study uh sports science or we could we could link up with a university in nepal and develop something in nepal so like i wanted to ask you is something like sports science for one for the future or will it be replaced by something else uh no i think sports science will be here for a long long time i mean i don't think it will change i think it will just evolve you know so so like any area sports science will evolve um and will get better um i think there's a lot to go as technology uh the more data that um is is available we have to learn how to manage that data how to visualize that data and um i definitely think it's one that uh, will be here for a long time however um like any field if it's not done well um you know we're always going to have problems and and that's why sports science won't progress but i do believe it has its place in football i would love to see it develop in a country like nepal of course i knew like uh, we have spoken quite a while and you know it's generally more related to the you know like physical aspect do you also focus on the mental aspects yes absolutely i mean that's the psychology but i i encompass that all into what we what we do uh the mental aspects are very important um and the university that i'm associated with in australia the australian catholic university is a leader in um high performance sport and the education of students in that area we really take a holistic view to the athlete you can't just look at them physically it's physiological psychological you know sociological even all these things come into play and and depending on what country you work thing in you've got cultural issues as well uh nutritional aspects different diets um it's just about getting the best for these players to perform and you like uh, ideally like we speak about mental health and like how do you analyze the health of, of a person mentally like what do you do what, are, what what is the process yeah look one of the cornerstones of my work is is monitoring athletes on a daily basis so using a uh basically an an app where they they answer questions on a daily basis and one of those questions is how are they feeling psychologically also there's technology you can use that will have some uh give you some idea of their psychology you can see that ring I'm using now that's called an aura ring that monitors all my sleep and my heart rate and my heart rate variability heart rate variability is an interesting one because that is uh can show signs of stress and when that starts to dip you know you can identify you know or ask the question is that physical stress or psychological stress and to see how how the person is coping mental well-being is a very important thing and particularly at this stage during a pandemic where a lot of people um and players accordingly um uh, are struggling because they might be away from their families and having a difficult time you know like i have i got some few good questions in my mind again okay? it's like since you've worked in this this part of the world you know like with iran and everything where the maybe the temperatures go very high you know yes. like so do you think like something like water break should be made compulsory a uh, look the, the the water break or the the mid uh, mid break on each half i mean fifa has a rule about that when it's over a certain temperature there has to be a break so so that just 
that's just part of of the FIFA rules. And yes, when I've been involved uh, with teams playing in high temperatures, such as in uh, Dubai or Abu Dhabi or Qatar or Saudi Arabia, yeah, there's been times when those breaks have to have to happen and occur. It's very difficult playing in high temperatures, but um, that's why places like Nepal and that have an advantage. You've got to use it to your advantage. So, like, you know, like, generally we say that, you know, like, you, okay, you're going to a more, you know, like, uh, you are going to a place with a higher temperature and it'll be difficult to play. But how is it difficult? What makes it difficult for the players? Well, you know, when, when you're playing in high temperatures uh, and you're not accustomed to the high temperatures, it just impacts our aerobic system significantly. So it means that we just will get fatigued easier uh, and not be able to run as far in a game or um, that we're going to be under that constant pressure, particularly if you haven't had time to adapt to those high temperatures. All right, so it's really going to compromise the aerobic power of an athlete. Officer, and I'll uh, talk about a, more of a current affairs. And you're like, uh, you have had in the Premier League a lot of managers complaining about how, how they did not have good, enough time, you know, like for maybe the pre season. How important is pre season for a good season? Look, I, I always think whatever's in front of me that's what you've got to adapt to. If the preseason is four weeks, if it's six weeks, sometimes in Australia, we have a 16 week preseason. So it's very, very long. I look, the, the secret to a good preseason is that you in the off season, you don't get too out of shape or you don't get to let yourself go too much, but definitely four to six weeks is adequate to prepare players for it for a new season. What you need to do is psychologically be prepared after a long season. Sometimes players feel burnt out and exhausted, um, uh, cognitively exhausted, so their mind is exhausted. So they need to get away, have a break. But physically, you know, at an elite level, we can get players ready in four to six weeks. There's no problem with that. Definitely, you know, like I wanted to ask you, like you know, like uh, this upcoming season, at least in terms of the Premier League or in the European. Uh, season, the season is kind of cramped and there were also like talks of having introducing five substitutes. Should that have been passed for the Premier League? I don't like the idea of five substitutes. Simply the reason I don't like the idea of five substitutes is I pride myself on getting our teams physically ready. So if I can work on my team and but we're allowed five substitutes I think it takes away the, from needing the, the, the skill of good sports science. Because five substitutes, that's half the out, outfield players, true? Um, they, they just finished off the national competition in Australia and they allowed five substitutes. I, I don't like five substitutes. So like, uh, what's the idea behind allowing five substitutes? I think what they were saying is, it will, you know, it was going to reduce the incidents of injury uh, and because the players might not have had a long enough time to prepare but I, you know I think that's part of the game isn't it it's like that's part of the skill of preparing players get them prepared the game is three substitutes not five substitutes five substitutes for me it starts to get a bit like ice hockey doesn't it you know where they change every time I don't like that so, like, do you think, like, because uh, they they have not had enough time to prepare, which was, I think, the uh, brainchild of having five substitute, you like, you'll see more injuries in the upcoming season. Look, if players are poorly prepared, you know, if the training loads have not been adequate or they've been too much, players are going to be vulnerable any time of the year, a any season. You always see injuries at the start of a season because players have done too much or maybe too little in the preparation period. So I don't think we should say injuries are related just to COVID-19. Injuries are related to poor preparation. And that's where good sports science can make all the difference. Of course, and I wanted to ask you, like, do, uh, in your experience, do coaches push players a lot more than they should? <clears throat> well, well, <laughs> Yes, I, I have seen that. But what you try to do is to work with coaches so they can get the best outcome they, they require. 
but we also maintain a healthy, uh, healthy playing group. So yes, I try and work with coaches to educate them as much as possible to say, yes, we can push them hard. However, if we push them hard the wrong way, physically, the human body won't cope. But yes, we can still train very hard, but do it, uh, do it effectively if we get the training loads managed in the, in the right program. Of course, and you have also written a lot of books, and I think your uh, your your new book, I think, is Self Science. What is it? What is that about? Oh, well, Self Science is more a mainstream book, not just for sports scientists. It's very much about people studying themselves as a scientist. So, so studying themselves, uh, I call it a study of you by you. So you be, can become really understanding of what is best for you to make sure you're physically and psychologically right, to understand how much sleep do you need? Uh, what sort of exercise are you doing? What food is best for you? Because you know what? You're unique. You're one in seven and a half billion people. So you're quite different. We are very different to the person next to us or other people. So what we need to do is start becoming a little bit more understanding of ourselves, like you. You studied computer science many years. You're a smart person. Do you think you've studied yourself as much as you've studied computer science? I don't know. <laughs> that's right. Well, the number one thing we need to study is ourselves. So I, that's the book of self science and it teaches people about how to do that. And then goes through the fundamentals of, um, basically self awareness and, uh, for them to learn, you know, how to exercise, what to eat, uh, different parts of their lifestyle. So yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, a new book of mine just out actually. So that's exciting. So I wanted to ask you, do you like writing books a lot? Yes, I, I, I actually do. That's my third book. Um, and I think I'll, I'll do more and, uh, I also write research papers as well. And, uh, you know, I write a blog, you know, my own website, where I write on a regular basis, but you know, I do enjoy writing. I think it's uh, an interesting area. No, like writing a research paper is still fine because you know your domain, what you're going to write for. And, but writing a book, maybe you have to reinvent yourself every time. How do you do that? You just need anything in life. You need discipline, uh, you know, to write and you might set yourself a target of, of writing 500 words a day and, and then you just do it. And, um, but do you know what, this last book, I just did it. I wrote and wrote and, uh, but look, it did take a couple of years for it to get done and to finalize and to get it out into print. So look, like anything, it takes, it takes work, but it was very enjoyable. Like, I wanted to ask you, like, even I have aspirations of writing a book someday. I have decided like some topics and all those. How do you come up on the topics that, oh, on what your book is going to be based about. Will you tell me what, do, what are those topics? What do you want to write about? I have a lot, like, I don't know, like general, like you, like you have your own experiences that you would want to write maybe in terms of fiction or maybe through just, uh, nonfiction, even you can maybe base it around someone else. So it's just like general, I don't, um, I have no plans of writing like you, like where you have, it's more holistic approach. Like your book is books are more, which can be even considered maybe somewhere down the line, maybe you can find it in the hand of maybe a sports scientist, you know, like reading it for his, uh, exams. So my is not that, uh, genre actually. Yeah. No, but, but I think what you, what you do is you just start to write each day. You start to write what comes into your mind and you just, just write and don't wait for one day. I heard you say, I'm going to wait for one day, start it tomorrow. I want to see you start it tomorrow and then maybe you start a blog, um, yeah. you know, writing each day. My first book actually was from my blog where I wrote every day or, or wrote regularly. And then I put all those together and it, and it was a book, um, it's somewhere here. Uh, it was called sports science is not rocket science. And, uh, that was, that was my first book. So you could do that. You just start writing every day. Um, you live in an amazing, interesting country. You could just write what you see every day. And, uh, I think it would be wonderful. No, I was just seeing the uh, list of, uh, 
chapter headings that I have written already. But it's been I have stalled it for quite a while now. You know, like hopefully I'll start writing soon. Okay, now you tell me what's stopping you starting. I don't know. You just find an excuse not to start. You know, like you convince yourself, okay, I'll start tomorrow, which I have to change. But yeah, so that's one excuse that I have for myself, which I have to personally change. I think so. Okay, I want to see the first chapter soon. Hopefully, <laughs> so I'll, I'll I'll move on to more other topics. And you know, like I asked few friends, like okay, what can I ask a sports scientist that is coming? And they also, uh, you know, like work in similar fields. So I have some few maybe more technical questions which I do not know anything about. Maybe. So I'll just ask them to you or go from their side. So first one is: Is caffeine really ergogenic for everyone? What was that? Sorry. Is caffeine? Yes. Ergogenic for everyone. Oh, that's a very good question. <clears throat> caffeine does enhance our, uh, you know, our performance in respect to that. Uh, you know, studies have shown people uh, that you know consume caffeine. Uh, in a, a short period before they have to perform, are able to perform longer or at a higher intensity. However, this is where actual self-science comes into it. Does every human be affected by caffeine the same way? The answer is absolutely not. It needs to be practiced uh, to see how it affects you positively. I know people that do not have caffeine um, and if they were to have caffeine, they might have some sickness or they mightn't feel so good and it mightn't have that positive effect. But overall, caffeine is very powerful and very good for the majority of players. So yes, in football, I do advocate the use of caffeine, um, but it has to be in the right, um, the right uh, format and it has to be trialed before they're actually using it and the right quantity as well. Of course. And uh, so basically it's like, it depends on person to person. Yes. I, kind I, of. What I say is that I want to see people trial it in training or before, uh, before games and then we can know. But overall, the question is, is caffeine good for performance? Yes, it is. Okay. So do you personally recommend it to your athletes who come to you? Yes. Okay, so is it in the I, form? I, de I definitely recommend that they try it, and it is a it is a good performance enhancer. So, do you like uh, recommend it in the form of coffee, or is it capsules? You can take it. Look, capsules are very um, are very easy because you know a capsule might be a hundred milligrams of coffee, so that's uh, of of caffeine. Sorry, so that's good. I know it in that in that yeah. But, you know, some people might like it in a short shot of coffee. But, you know, when it's measured, I know exactly how much is in it. There are some supplements as well uh, that have a caffeine base. Um, the, the main thing is not to have too much uh, because once you get over a certain quantity, it's just going to, it's not going to have any positive. And so more is not better in respect to caffeine. Of course, and uh, I'll move on to the next question. And the next one comes something like this. Is a low carb high fat diet effective for athletes? That's a very good question. And uh, a, low f uh, uh, a low carb, high fat diet uh, has become more popular. It depends on the athlete. So friends of mine have done studies with power lifters using a low carb, high fat diet. Uh, so obviously they've been able to reduce their weight but also maintain their strength. So they're being able to compete at a different weight category. However, I've seen so some soccer players do it. And if it's done wrong and they haven't, their body has not had time to adapt, they will struggle. So I don't recommend it to uh, football players. If they really want to go down that track, then I would refer them on to, I've got a very good friend that's, um, <clears throat> There's very, uh, a professor that knows this area very well, and I would refer them to him uh, to, to uh, follow uh, the regime that he sets out. In actual fact, myself, personally, I follow a low carbohydrate diet, uh, but that's just for my health. I, I find that I function better uh, on that respect. It makes it controlling my weight very easy, and um, yeah, 
I, I've followed such a diet for probably three and a half years now. And yeah, I won't change. So I'd struggle in Nepal where there's a lot of rice. huh? Yeah. So I wanted to ask you like in that question itself, does what the uh, question is basically low carb, high fat, is that keto? Yeah. Look, I follow a ketogenic diet. Yeah. Uh, a keto diet. So, um, yeah, but I don't recommend it for football players. Definitely. So, uh, uh, like I wanted to ask you, like, why do you follow keto? Like, when did you come across or what pulled you towards it? Look, uh, you know, like I said, one of my very good friends, uh, uh, a professor at the university I work with, he's uh, an advocate of it. He studied it. Um, you know, we had a discussion about it. And then, you know, through his influence, I started it. It was very hard at the start. I had no energy. Uh, I was tired and uh, that sort of thing. But then my, my body adapted. And now a few years later, I, I run every day. I, you know, have, have uh, done a, you know, half marathon, etc. cetera, on, a, on this sort of diet. So I function quite well. Um, and the beauty is it's very good if you, you actually want to lose some weight. Of course, so I have two more questions from the viewers before I move on to more lighter topics. These are out of my, I would probably not be able to frame these questions, which I got from my friends. So the next one is, are isometric loading exercises as effective as eccentric loading exercises for hamstring injury prevention? Yeah, that's a really good question. You're getting some good questions from your friends. Um, look, I think uh, isometric exercises with... Um, you know, with hamstrings, uh, do, do have some positive, uh, outcomes, but definitely the eccentric loading has been shown to, uh, be most positive. So I would go with the eccentric, uh, type loading on the, on the hamstrings. However, um, you could incorporate some isometric work as well, but definitely, uh, the, uh, eccentric, uh, what we call the Nordic, uh, hamstring, uh, race, we can use that uh, and that's been shown through research to be quite positive. Actual fact, the leaders in that research area are from my university. So yeah, they spend a lot of time studying hamstring injuries. Of course, uh, like, you know, I think you have to clear some things for me and also for some listeners. What is isometric and what is eccentric? Well, isometric is where there's, there's no change in the muscle. So it's just holding the, you know, holding the muscle. So if you can see what I'm doing now, if I'm pushing my hands together, I just hold it. That's isometric contraction. Uh, eccentric is when, um, you know, we're lowering or lengthening the muscle. So what they're talking about there with the hamstring is that they would be lowering it. Okay. That, you know, so where there's strain on the hamstring and the hamstring is lengthening. So I just have a doubt is cycling eccentric compared to running? Cycling eccentric. Is cycling? Uh, no. cycling has the components of concentric and eccentric, but you know, it's, it's mainly concentric, you know, so it's a mainly a, a pushing or a yeah motion. So it's quite, uh, quite different. There is obviously an eccentric component. There's an eccentric component in running as, as well. So there's concentric contraction and eccentric contraction. Of course. So I'll move on to the last question. And this is, uh, what is VO2 max and how does it measure cardiovascular fitness? Well, basically VO2 max is, as it said, it's, you know, our maximum oxygen uh, capacity. So it's important in a sport such as football, you know, what your maximum oxygen carrying capacity is, you know, how, how big your aerobic system is, but it's an important measure. All right, but what's probably more important is how much of that capacity can you use? You could have a big VO2 max and there's a lot of genetics uh, involved in that. But if you can't use it all, okay, then you've got a problem. We've got to train that. On the same token, if you only have a very small aerobic uh, capacity, that could be a problem as well. So a football player, most elite football players have, you know, uh, quite a a significantly sized uh, aerobic capacity and you know because they've got a you know there's that continuous activity in actual fact the athletes that have the highest vo2 max recorded are normally cross-country skiers 
Of course, I wanted to. I picked up a word from what you said, you know, and it's maybe not what you meant, but uh, you spoke of genetics. I wanted to ask, how much does that affect a player's ability? In football, uh, football has some genetic components in respect to your your speed and your aerobic capacity. However, football is a pretty good game that genetics doesn't play a major part. So, you know, say genetics you know, might, uh, you know, have an impact of 20%, 30%. I'm not sure. I'm just, just stating a number. But if you look at basketball, you look at the NBA in the States, you can see genetics plays a really big part because if you're not tall, you've got to be an exceptionally good player in some respect. But if you're just seven foot during because of genetics and you can bounce the ball and move a little bit, more than likely you're going to be a bit of success in basketball. So football's a great game. All shapes and sizes can play it. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's no doubt, you know, in many sports, genetics has a, a big component. Like you and I can train all we want, uh, but we're not going to win the 100 meters at the Olympics. Because I wanted to ask you, like, you know, like, you said, like, you, like, for NBA, like, you know, like, if you're not genetically tall, you would be at a disadvantage compared to others. Like, have you ever come across a team where you had to train players according to their role? Like, suppose what role they play in the team. Like, suppose if you're not tall in an NBA team, maybe you would do some other part. Yes, uh, but there's very few positions in, like, the NBA that you can play when you're not tall. Like, you know, there's very few players that have been successful that are under, you know, 6'1", 6'2". That, that, you know, 6'2", 6'3", is considered short, all right? And so that's, you know, 186, 180, 188 is considered small. Um, so that's a problem. Look, uh, you know, definitely in football, there's different positions, like the side backs, the people out wide. They have to run a lot up and down, which is quite different to the central defenders that don't have to perform so much physical movement, etc. Of course, so like, you know, like, uh, like from the perspective of a, a player, maybe young or old, like if you had to suggest like how to maybe like evolve the game, you know, like be more injury free, because I think that's the main aim of most scientists, you know, sports scientists to make the player injury free. What would you suggest? Like, what should they do to maybe extend their career and come across less injuries? Look, one of the biggest things that's a problem in, in football is that players aren't strong enough. So doing strength training will, will help uh, this and, and to have a very good holistic program, a well-structured program. But I, if you ask me that question, what could most football players uh, get better at? I would say... Uh, doing strength training and being stronger. So, like, how much of a difference does strength training do, uh, you know, like, help the player? Well, I think it makes a significant difference because if you look at speed, the foundation of speed is strength, isn't it? You know, strength and then power and then speed. So if you're not strong, <clears throat> then your, your body, you know, won't really carry you the way you, you need it to. So... Across Asia, one of the biggest things is people can increase and improve their strength. Of course, so I'll move to a more personal note and like, which, which is your most favorite team in the world in terms of football? Uh, look, uh, you know, I've always been a Liverpool supporter as a, you know, as a kid. I mean, that was, that was, uh, yeah, who, who I primarily probably supported, so... Yeah, so that sport, uh, that team. But, you know, most of the time I, I really like teams that I'm actually working with and, you know, at that time I, I'll support them. But I'd say overall it'd be Liverpool. So, yeah, talking about Liverpool, like you have Klopp there who is known for his high-intensity playing. How, how much do the sports scientists have to work behind the scene for that to be, you know, like achieved? Yeah, look, he trains these people very hard. So, um you know, a sports scientist would be working on managing uh, the players and working with the physiotherapist to make sure that their fatigue levels are, are low and, and giving good data to, uh, to the coach uh, and to make sure that the team is doing what he, what he wants them to do. So, yes, a sports scientist would be working 
uh, effectively with that that head coach. But he's a very very good coach. So yeah. Hopefully, so you know, like uh, I'll move on to your last question. You know, like if you were given the opportunity to work with one of these two players, whom would you work with, Ronaldo or Messi? Oh, for me, uh, I think a Ronaldo, because Ronaldo is, uh, you know, Messi is very fast and uh, has been very successful. But you can see Ronaldo has, uh, from an athletic perspective, he's, he's very, uh, he's, he's a very good athlete, uh, and he takes that side of the training very seriously. I would like to work with him to see how long he could play for. I think he could play well into his forties and be successful still. So that's what I get great enjoyment out of working with players to see how long they can play. One of my favorite players ever was an Australian player called Tim Cahill, played in four World Cups. And I worked extensively with him and, uh, and he, was, he retired at 39 or 40. I believe Tim could have gone on and played till he was 45. But I, I get great enjoyment seeing players uh, play uh, longer because I think sometimes age is overrated as being a negative and people you know if they're interested they could probably play a lot longer of course so I'll just sneak in one question that I got in you know, like I'll take an example like you have someone like James Milner who at this age right now is also still going and probably one of the most fittest of the team one of the fittest players in Liverpool and you have someone like Michael Owen who kind of in his late 20s already was looking for retirement. Do you think they were just unfortunate with the injuries or fortunate with the injuries that they had or was it something with the sports scientist team when they were young that, you know, like they did not work properly? Look, it's very difficult for me to, to say because I don't know the specific players. However, what you sometimes find is that, look, genetics might play a part in that. Um, often players that are very, very fast uh, break down a lot more with injuries uh, and maybe they mightn't, you know, there's the other reason that players don't do all the work that they're required from early in their career and don't manage themselves. And the other fact is maybe Michael Owen was just ready to retire, you know, because you think uh, a lot of people, uh, they start playing at such a young age and they have a successful career and they might want to move on to other parts of their life. So, I don't really know, but what I do know is sports science can help players play um, much longer, uh, as long as they possibly want to play, uh, if they want to keep playing. I, I, I get great enjoyment out of trying to help players uh, extend their careers. So nearly, I'll ask one final question. It's like, in your career till now, which has been the most proudest moment in terms of football? I would say um, Australia winning the Asian Cup in 2015 uh, against uh, South Korea because it was in Sydney, uh, it was in front of, you know, 85,000 Australians. It was the biggest uh, trophy that an Australian team had ever won. Uh, we won it an extra time. We were the fittest team in the tournament. So that was a very proud moment. Uh, I enjoyed that very much. Um, a, a club side I was winning won the Asian Champions League that I was working with, Western Sydney Wanderers. But I would definitely say the Australian national team. But, you know, I also enjoyed very much working with the Iran national team and uh, working with those people there and uh, that. But I'd definitely say 215, Australia winning the Asian Cup. So on that note, Dr. Greg, thank you so much for talking to me and I wish you all the best with your future endeavors. Maybe you can write one more book or maybe you can work with Nepal. You never know. And uh, Always. All you got to do is ask me and I'm happy to help the people of Nepal anytime. Sure. Thank you so much for coming and take care. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you very much.